Hello everyone, uh, this is Freya and welcome to our very first uh, episode of the Q&A time. The first uh, question has been asked by Alissa Brin. She asks, do you work uh, with the land better often? If so, what ways can you work? with them. In order to understand how to work with the land better, it is important to have a clear understanding of who they are. Personally, I see them as animist spirits of the land itself and its features. I work on a daily basis with them for the sake of the land and the well-being of the wildlife. When the work you do with them is correct, you will experience great fertility and beauty of the land you live in and abundance of wildlife. Last winter we have had lynxes in our garden. That is totally exceptional if we consider the hermit nature of these animals. I have always thought to work with them you need to work with the land. If there is no engagement with the land, there is no real connection that can take place. For engagement, I mean solid daily relationship with the land, which does not translate necessarily in ritualistic approach, but also basic approach the clearing of dry leaves in the autumn season, the giving of nutrients to the land in the summer season. Whatever generates engagement and connection with the land, that is, as a matter of fact, a way to actively work with them. So if you asked how have you worked with the vetter last week, I would tell you I have gathered and collected over 20 wheelbarrows of dead leaves from the ground and placed them on top of my outside witchcraft house. So they will become fertile soil for growth during the next summer season. Get your hands in the mud and soil. There is great connection to be found there with yourself, the land and its spirit. Also another piece of advice is to have the land you work with as raw as possible, as that is the home of the Vetter before being our home. Acknowledge their presence the more you can. I often knock on the ground when I feel there is activity to tell them I am there in respect of a shared space. I leave offerings that are correct for the wildlife of the land where I live. This means that beer and tobacco would not be my choice where I live because of the abundance of wildlife we have. But you would maybe see me spreading some salt on stones around my property for the reindeer to lick. The second question has been asked by Ashley. She asks, how is someone chosen to become a vulva? I struggle with the concept of something or someone choosing me to become something. It is disappointing to say the least and disrespectful of the bond me, myself and I build with the land on a daily basis. If anything has to choose that, that would be my soul. The experience I gained through years of wandering, the forests I have walked, the mountains I have climbed, the water that cleansed my body. These are the only ones to have that power. If we go into the etymology of the word vulva, we see it means stuff. 
carrier or the one that is a stick, a cane, meant to support her spiritual and physical body when she walked the terrain to head from place to place. Nobody has the power to put that stick in your hands and have you walk. You are the only one that can physically grab it and walk the land long distances to gain knowledge and wisdom from the land itself. The third question has been asked by Linny. She asks, when did you realize you are a witch and how did that happen? I am born in Italy. My grandparents were both great tarot readers and when I was 12 they gifted me with a tarot deck. The time spent with that deck in that young age where imagination is your greatest ally had me figure out pretty fast. I would say those cards to me had more value in regards to them being a passageway into experiencing reality in a much faster way than my physical eyes could possibly meet. The fortune telling aspect appeared so limiting to my eyes. Those drawings as ancient petroglyphs were portals into worlds and layers of life I needed to explore. There my realization not of what I was but of what I could have become if I chose to go through those passageways. I saw great potential there and I started to walk that way and I still do with the same curiosity. The next question has been asked by Kara Lee. Would you be writing a book on how to do Nordic witchcraft? No, I won't for now. I am more of a storyteller in nature. By nature, I prefer stories around a fire. This is a bit how I got to understand the total lack of literature in regards to Sami witchcraft, because they told their stories by the fire and under the northern lights. So I have learned that if I want to hear those stories and learn, I I need to be around a fire and under the northern lights. You see, I see my videos as my legacy, so to speak, as a way more in tune with myself to pass down whatever I feel needs to be passed down. The next question has been asked by Don Paul. He says, do you have any book you can recommend about Sami mythology? Well, um, I believe a must read is Lopisk Mythology, Eventure o Folkesang by Jens Andreas Fries and fragments of uh, Lop mythology written between 1838-1845 by Swedish minister Lars Levi Lestadius, which is a five-part uh, book treating gods sacrifice, divination, traditional tales, very, very interesting. The next question has been asked by Dara Win Snap. Um, are you also a healer or is it another path? In my life uh, so far, I have met the Saiva Rien, the Saiva reindeer, spiritual ally assistant. So the type of healing, Shika Nin, in my case, Sing Ham, I have been shown is on the land. The Saivu spirits are spirits of the mountains and stones. I have been uh, illustrated several Sami healing methods from the elders residing where I live. And as a sorceress, I mold and shape energies every day. 
The next question has been asked by Gatto Electro. She says, can you please speak about devotional chords in the Norse path? To me, a devotional chord is a physical thread I create to connect with a god, a goddess, spirit, animal, and so on. The whole concept here is to create a thread where the elements I choose to weave in can draw me closer to this or that spirit or entity. Each of the steps on the ladder chord are meant to lead you to a devotional goal. For example, if I want to create a chord to connect with the Gabba, I will make sure the thread I use is white. To place on the thread rain love Icelandic moss and attach it to the thread with a drop of white candle wax. I will place on the ladder cord a hair from a reindeer. I have a bond with a reindeer bone found in nature. I will make sure to use the rune Urus, the antlered rune that can be easily written on a piece of bark and knotted into the thread. And a piece of antler and something that carries my energy signature. For example, a drop of my saliva or menstrual blood or sweat or a tear. This technique applies to any god or goddess, but to be able to have this type of sorcery work, you need to know the god, the goddess you want to draw closer real, real well. To the point you will have no doubt in regards to what elements you want to incorporate in the thread cord ladder. When you feel this type of sorcery has worked, burn the ladder to release the energies bound to it. The last question of this Q&A time has been asked by Matt Kellu. He says, ancestral veneration, is it actually possible and would that be done through meditation? Ancestral veneration is a practice that nearly all pagan people, past and present, have shared. To me, the same order of the runes represents the development and evolution of all life, from the simplest to the most advanced. That is why I tend to use the rune Urus when it comes to the worship of ancestors, because it represents the indomitable force and an energy that cannot be tamed. The voice of the land, its spirit and its people. I love Urus for its loud manner, which beautifully depicts the wild energy I see as the main energy of the ancestral type of work. An energy that is so wild that allows me to become a stone, a past elder to become me and use my hands and voice. Ancestral work is truly an ever-boiling cauldron that needs constant stirring and shaking and the energy of Urus is perfect for mixing shapes, colors and ingredients. For this reason I am more on the active side when it comes to the ancestral worshipping and very little devotional because I want to give them my body to dance, my hands to drum, my voice to yoik and sing, but I also have more devotional ways of honoring them. Two in particular are my preferred ones. I place soil on the altar as a reminder. The soil they have become is not buried, but planted in the ground to create more life. Or I drop food on the ground outside to generate a faster dialogue when I need it or I feel they need it. 
Thank you so very much uh, for watching this video. Thanks uh, for spending some of your time uh, here with me today. It's been truly appreciated and I'll see you all uh, in my next uh, video. Thanks again. Hello.